Okay, good day to all of you. So we're already on Chapter 6 of William Stallings Computer Organization and Architecture 10th Edition. So Chapter 6 is all about external memory. So this chapter examines the range of external memory devices and systems. We begin with the most important device, the magnetic disk. Magnetic disks are the foundation of external memory on virtually all computer systems. The next section examines the use of disk arrays to achieve great performance, looking specifically at the family of systems known as RAID or the redundant array of independent disks. An increasingly important component of many computer systems is the solid state disk, which is discussed next after RAID, and then external optical memory is also examined. Finally, magnetic tape is also described. So let's delve with Chapter 6 external memory, first with magnetic disk. So a disk is a circular platter constructed of non-magnetic material called the substrate coated with magnetizable material. Traditionally, the substrate has been an aluminum or aluminum alloy material. More recently, glass substrates have been introduced. The glass substrate has a number of benefits including the following. First is improvement in the uniformity of the magnetic film surface to increase disk reliability. Another, a significant reduction in overall surface defects to help reduce read-write errors. Next is ability to support lower fly heights and then better stiffness to reduce disc dynamics and greater ability to withstand shock and damage. So what is the magnetic read and write mechanisms? So data are recorded on and later retrieved from the disc via a conducting coil named the head. In many systems, there are two heads, a read head and a write head. During a read or write operation, the head is stationary while the platter rotates beneath it. The write mechanism exploits the fact that electricity flowing through a coil produces a magnetic field. Electric pulses are sent to the right head and the resulting magnetic patterns are recorded on the surface below with different patterns for positive and negative currents. The right head itself is made of easily magnetizable material and is in the shape of a rectangular donut with a gap along one side and a few turns of conducting wire along the opposite side. We are going to see it in the next figure. An electric current in the wire induces a magnetic field across the gap, which in turn magnetizes a small area of the recording medium. Reversing the direction of the current reverses the direction of the magnetization on the recording medium. The traditional read mechanism exploits the fact that a magnetic field moving relative to a coil produces an electrical current in the coil. When the surface of the disk passes under the head, it generates a current of the same polarity as the one already recorded. The structure of the head for reading is in this case essentially the same as for writing and therefore the same head can be used for both. Such single heads are used in floppy disks systems and in older rigid disk systems. Contemporary rigid disk systems use a different read mechanism, requiring a separate read head positioned for convenience close to the right head. The head consists of a partially shielded magnetoresistive or MR sensor, and the MR material has an electrical resistance that depends on the direction of the magnetization of the medium moving under it. By passing a current through the MR sensor, resistance changes are detected as voltage signals. The MR design allows higher frequency operation, which equate to greater storage densities and operating speeds. So the next figure, figure 6.1, it shows the inductive write magnetoresistive read head. So as we can see in the figure, we have the for the write head and then this is also this is used for the read. And then next is we have another figure, figure 6.2. So the head is relatively small device capable of reading from or writing to a portion of the platter rotating beneath it. This gives rise to the organization of data on the platter in a concentric set of rings called tracks. Each track is the same width as the head. There are thousands of tracks per surface. So in this figure for the disk data layout depicts this data layout. Adjacent tracks are separated by intertrack gaps. This prevents or at least minimizes errors due to misalignment of the head or simply interference of magnetic fields. Data are transferred to and from the disk in sectors. There are typically hundreds of sectors per track 
and this may be of either fixed or variable length. In most contemporary systems, fixed length sectors are used, with 512 bytes being the nearly universal sector size. To avoid imposing unreasonable precision requirements on the system, adjacent sectors are separated by intersector gaps. And then the next figure is we have the comparison of disk layout method. So we have letter A, we have the constant angular velocity, and letter B, multiple zone recording. So a bit near the center of a rotating disk travels past a fixed point, such as a read-write head, slower than a bit on the outside. Therefore, some way must be found to compensate for the variation in speed so that the head can read all the bits at the same rate. This can be done by increasing the spacing between bits of information recorded in segments of the disk. The information can then be scanned at the same rate by rotating the disk at a fixed speed, known as the constant angular velocity or the CAV. So for figure 6.3a, which has the constant angular velocity, shows the layout of a disk using CAV. So the disk is divided into a number of pie-shaped sectors and into a series of concentric tracks. And then... The advantage of using CAV is that individual blocks of data can be directly addressed by the track and sector. To move the head from its current location to a specific address, it only takes a short movement of the head to a specific track and a short wait for the proper sector to spin under the head. The disadvantage of CAV is that the amount of data that can be stored on the long outer tracks is only the same as what can be stored on the short inner track. So, the, the, as I repeat, the only disadvantage is that if you're going to store data here, with, uh, it has only the same size as the outer. Even though, as we can see, uh, the outer um, tracks has greater space than the space uh, nearer the center of the, the disk. Because the density in bits per linear inch increases in moving from the outermost track to the innermost track, disk storage capacity in a straightforward CAV system is limited by the maximum recording density that can be achieved on the innermost track. To increase density, modern hard disk systems use a technique known as multiple zone recording, in which the surface is divided into a number of concentric zones. So 16 is typical. So compared with the with constant angular velocity um, storing of uh, data, which um, um, does not maximize the space for multiple zone recording, as you can see, depending on the size of the of the concentric tracks, um, it, it will be divided differently compared with the inner tracks. So within the zone, the number of bits per track is constant. Zones farther from the center contain more bits or more sectors than zone closer to the center. This allows for greater overall storage capacity at the expense of somewhat more complex circuitry. As the disk head moves from one zone to another, the length along the track of individual bit changes, causing a change in the timing for reads and writes. So for letter B, it is a simplified MZR layout with 15 tracks organized in two five zones. So the innermost two zones, so which is this one, have two tracks on each. So we have one, two, so that's why it's two tracks. And in each track having nine sectors. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, if you're going to count it. Then the next zone has three tracks. So this one, three tracks. And then each with 12 sectors, if you're going to count, and the outermost two zones have four tracks each, each with each track having 16 sectors. If you're going to count, this is, uh, this is 16 sectors. So next figure is we have sig figure 6.4, so Winchester disk format. Um, of specific um, brand of disks, the Seagate ST506. So some means is needed to locate sector positions within a track. Clearly, 
There must be some starting point on the track and a way of identifying the start and end of each sector. These requirements are handled by means of control data recorded on the disk. Thus, the disk is formatted with some extra data used only by the disk drive and not accessible to the user. So an example of disk formatting is shown in this figure. In this case, each track contains 30 fixed length sectors of 600 bytes each. Each sector holds 512 bytes of data plus control information useful to the disk controller. The ID field is a unique identifier or address used to locate a particular sector. The sync byte is a special bit pattern that delimits the beginning of the field. The track number identifies a track on a surface. The head number identifies a head. Because this disk has multiple surfaces, as explained, the ID and data fields each contain an error detecting code. Next is a table, table 6.1, all about physical characteristics of these systems. So this lists the major characteristics that differentiate among the various types of magnetic disks, such as the head motion. Head motion can be fixed head, one per track, or movable head, one per surface. For disk portability, it can be a non-removable disk or a removable disk. And then the sides can be single-sided or double-sided for platters, maybe single platter or multiple platter. And then for head me mechanism, it can be by use of a contact, by using floppy disk. I don't know if there are still uh, persons or computers that still employ floppy disk drives. And then it can also be fixed gap and aerodynamic gap such as the Winchester. Okay, next, uh, let's deal with the characteristics. Okay, first is the head may either be fixed or movable with respect to the radial direction of the platter. In a fixed head disc, there is one read-write head per track. All of the heads are mounted on a rigid arm that extends across all tracks. Such systems are rare today. In a movable head disc, there is only one read-write head. Again, the head is mounted on an arm. Because the head must be able to be positioned above any track, the arm can be extended or retracted for this purpose. The disc itself is mounted on in a disc drive, which contains of the arm a spindle that rotates the discs and the electronics needed for input and output of binary data. And then next is a non-removable disk is permanently mounted in the disk drive. The hard disk in a personal computer is a non-removable disk. A non a uh, meaning, though you can remove it technically, but you cannot, re that's why it's considered as non-removable because you cannot remove the hard disk drive while in its operation and the computer is turned on. And then a removable disk can be removed and replaced with another disk. The advantage of the latter type is that unlimited amounts of data are available with a limited number of disk systems. Furthermore, such a disk may be moved from one computer system to another. Floppy disk and zip cartridge disk are examples of removable disk. Actually, though, flash, disk dr flash drives are considered also as removable um, devices. Uh, they don't have this disk or the movable uh, movable platter. So for most disks, the magnetizable coating is applied to both sides of the platter, which is then referred to as double-sided. Some less expensive disk systems use single-sided disk. Some disk drives accommodate multiple platters stacked vertically a fraction of an inch apart. Multiple arms are provided. And then multiple platter disks employ a movable head with one read-write head head per platter surface. All of the heads are mechanically fixed so that all are at the same distance from the center of the disc and move together. Thus, any at any time, all of the heads are positioned over the tracks thereof of equal distance from the center of the disc. The set of all the tracks in the same relative position on the platter is referred to as cylinder, as this was illustrated in the, pre in the previous figure. Okay, next, aside from characteristics, is we have the disc classification. So finally, the head mechanism provides a classification of disk into three types. Traditionally, the read-write head has been positioned a fixed distance above the platter, allowing an air gap. At the other extreme is a head mechanism that actually comes into physical contact with the medium during a read or write operation. This mechanism is used with the floppy disk, the physical contact, which is a small flexible platter and the least expensive type of disk. But then, this floppy disk is already uh, old. Uh, I don't think there are already computer systems that still employ this floppy disk. Uh, 
So to understand the third type of disk, we need to comment on the relationship between the data density and the size of the air gap. The head must generate or sense an electromagnetic field of sufficient magnitude to read and write properly. The narrower the head is, the closer it must be to the platter surface to function. A narrower head means narrower tracks and therefore greater data density which is desirable. However, the closer the head is to the disk, the greater risk of error from impurities or imperfections. To push the technology further, the Winchester disk was developed. Winchester heads are used in sealed drive assemblies that are almost free of contaminants. They are designed to operate closer to the disk surface than conventional rigid disk heads, thus allowing greater data density. The head is actually an aerodynamic foil that rests lightly on the platter surface when the disk is motionless. The air pressure generated by a spinning disc is enough to make the foil rise above the surface. The resulting non-contact system can be engineered to use narrower heads that operate closer to the platter surface than conventional rigid disc heads. So in table 6.2, list the typical hard disk drive parameters. So the parameters, so it is shown here the different uh, models of Seagate hard disk drives. So, if for the up uh, for the Seagate Enterprise, of course, it is used for Enterprise, and this is their specification. For Seagate Barracuda XT, it is used for desktop, and it's this specification. And the Seagate Sheeta NS, so it is used as network attached storage or NAS and application server, and this are its specification. And then the Seagate laptop HDD, these are used for laptop, and these are the specifications. And next figure is we have figure 6.5, uh, the timing of a disk I.O. transfer. So the actual details of disk I.O. operation depend on the computer system, the operating system, and the nature of the I.O. channel and disk controller hardware. A general timing diagram is illustrated for a disk I.O. transfer. Okay, next is we have disk perfor performance parameters when the disk drive is operating the disk is rotating at constant speed to read or write the head must be positioned at the desired track and at the beginning of the desired tech sector on that track track selection involves moving the head in a movable head system or electronically selecting one head on a fixed head system on a movable head system the time it takes to position the head at the track is known as seek time in either case, once the track is selected, the disk controller waits until the appropriate sector rotates to line up with the head. The time it takes for the beginning of the sector to reach the head is known as rotational delay or rotational latency. The sum of the seek time, if any, and the rotational delay equals the access time, which is the time it takes to get into position to read or write. Once the head is in position, the read or write operation is then performed as the sector moves under the head. This is the data transfer portion of the operation. The time required for the transfer is the transfer time. In addition to the access time and transfer time, there are several queuing delays normally associated with the disk I.O. operation. When a process issues an I.O. request, it must first wait in a queue for the device to be available. At that time, the device is assigned to the process. If the device share a single I.O. channel or a set of I.O. channels with other disk drives, then there may be an additional wait for the channel to be available. At that point, the SIC is performed to begin disk access. In some high-end systems for servers, a technique known as rotational positional sensing or RPS is used. This works as follows. When the SIC command has been issued, the channel is released to handle other I.O. operations. When the SIC is completed, the device determines when the data will rotate under the head. As that sector approaches the head, the device tries to re-establish the communication path back to the host. If either the control unit or the channel is busy with another I.O., then the reconnection attempt fails and the device must rotate one whole revolution before it can attempt to reconnect, which is called an RPS miss. This is an extra delay element that must be added to the timeline of the previous figure. 
it is clear that the order in which sectors are read from the disk has a tremendous effect on I.O. performance. In the case of file access in which multiple sectors are read or written, we have some control over the way in which sectors of data are deployed. However, even in the case of a file access in a multi-programming environment, there will be I.O. requests competing for the same disk. Thus, it is worthwhile to examine ways in which the performance of disk I.O. can be improved over that achieved with purely random access to the disk. This leads to a consideration of disk scheduling algorithms which is uh, beyond the scope of this um, lesson and also this course, the Computer Organization and Architecture, and this is fully discussed in the operating systems. Okay, next. As we have another um, implementation of disk, which is called the RAID or the redundant array of independent disks. With the use of multiple disks, there is a wide variety of ways in which the data can be organized and which redundancy can be added to improve reliability. This could make it difficult to develop database schemes that are usable on a number of platforms and operating systems. Fortunately, industry has agreed on a standardized scheme for multiple disk database design known as RAID or, as I have mentioned, Redundant Array of Independent Disks. The RAID scheme consists of seven levels, 0 through 6. These levels do not imply a hierarchical relationship but designate different design architectures that share three common characteristics. Number one, RAID is a set of physical disk drives viewed by the operating system as a single logical drive. Next, data are distributed across the physical drives of an array in a scheme known as striping as described later on. Number three, redundant disk capacity is used to store parity information which guarantees data recoverability in case of a disk failure. So the details of the second and third characteristics differ for the different RAID levels. RAID 0 and RAID 1 do not support the third characteristic. The term RAID was originally coined in a paper by a group of researchers at the University of California at Berkeley. The paper outlined various RAID configurations and applications and introduced the definitions of the RAID levels that are still used. The RAID strategy employs multiple disk drives and distributes data in such a way as to enable simultaneous access to data from multiple drives, thereby improving I.O. performance and allowing easier incremental increases in capacity. So next is we have table 6.3, the RAID levels. So RAID levels is from um, 0 to 6. So the unique contribution of the RAID proposal is to address effectively the need for redundancy. Although allowing multiple heads and actuators to operate simultaneously achieves higher I.O. and transfer rates, the use of multiple devices increasing or increases the probability of failure. If you have a redundant disk, a copy of, of your disk, another copy, if your first disk fails, you have a second copy. So that's the, pr the proposal of implementing RAID. Um, uh, not uh, they, they, uh, not to increase uh, to increase the resiliency and lessen the failure. To compensate for this decreased reli reliability, RAID makes use of stored parity information that enables the recovery of data lost due to a disk failure. And then we now examine each of the RAID le le uh, levels uh, from the table provides a rough guide to the seven levels. In the table, I.O. performance is shown both in terms of data transfer capacity or ability to move data and I.O. request rate or ability to satisfy I.O. request. Since these RAID levels inherently perform differently relative to, from, to these two metrics, each RAID level strong point is highlighted by darker shading so these are the uh, advantages or highlights of each uh, raid levels okay so let's uh, have the next figure so uh, illustration in figure 6.6 .6, um, raid levels so this figure illustrates the use of the seven raid schemes to support a data capacity requiring for this with no redundancy so the figure highlight the layout of user data and redundant data and indicates the relative storage requirements of the various levels. We refer to these figures throughout the following discussion. Of the seven RAID levels described, only four are commonly used. So the RAID levels, we have zero, then we have one, 
and then we have 5 and then we have 5 and 6 so these are the commonly used uh, raid in the implementation Okay, so next figure is we have figure 6.7, data mapping for a RAID level 0 array. So let's first go with RAID level 0. So lev RAID level 0 is not a true member of the RAID family because it does not include redundancy to improve performance. However, there are a few applications such as some on microcomputers in which performance and capacity are primary concerns and low cost is more important than improved reliability. So for RAID 0, the user and system data are distributed across all of the disk in the array. This has a notable advantage over the use of a single large disk. If two different I.O. requests are pending for two different blocks of data, then there is a good chance that the requested blocks are on different disk. Thus, the two requests can be issued in parallel, reducing the I.O. queuing time. But... The disadvantage of RAID 0 is that, as with all the, of the RAID levels, goes further than simply distributing the data across a disk array. The data are striped across availab the available disks. This is best understood by considering this figure. All of the user and system data are viewed as being stored on a logical disk. So though you have uh, four physical disks, for a computer, it is considered as one logical disk. So the logical disk is divided into strips. These strips may be physical blocks, sectors, or some other unit. The strips are mapped round-robin to consecutive physical disks in the RAID array. A set of logically consecutive strips that maps exactly one strip to each array member is referred to as a stripe. In an end disk array, the first n logical strips are physically stored as the first strip on each of the end disks, forming the first stripe. The second n strips are distributed as the second strip on each disk, and so on. The advantage of this layout is that if a single I/O request consists of multiple logically contiguous strips, then up to n strips for that request can be handled in parallel, greatly reducing again the I/O transfer time. So this figure indicates the use of array management software to map between logical and physical disk space. This software may execute either in the disk subsystem or in a host computer. So to summarize the RAID level 0, so the performance of any of the RAID levels depending critically on the request patterns of the host system and on the layout of the data. These issues can be clearly addressed in RAID 0 where the impact of redundancy does not interfere with the analysis. First, let us consider the use of RAID 0 to achieve a high data transfer rate. For applications to experience a high transfer transfer rate, two requirements must be met. First, a high transfer capacity must exist along the entire path between the host memory and the individual disk drives. This includes internal controller buses, host system I.O. buses, I.O. adapters, and host memory buses. The second requirement is that the application must make I.O. requests that drive the disk array efficiently. This requirement is met if the typical request is for large amounts of logically contiguous data compared to the the size of a strip. In this case, a single I.O. request involves the parallel transfer of data from multiple disks, increasing the effective transfer rate compared to a single disk transfer. In a transaction-oriented environment, the user is typically more concerned with the response time than with the transfer rate. For an individual I.O. request for a small amount of data, the I.O. time is dominated by the motion of the disk heads, which is the seek time, and the movement of the disk, which is the rotational latency. In a transaction environment, there may be hundreds of I.O. requests per second. A disk array can provide high I.O. execution rates by balancing the I.O. load across multiple disks. Effective load balancing is achieved only if there are typically multiple I.O. requests outstanding. This in turn implies that there are multiple independent applications or a single transaction-oriented application that is capable of multiple asynchronous I.O. I.O. request. The performance will also be influenced by the strip size. If the strip size is relatively large, so that a simple I.O. request only involves a single disk access, then multiple waiting I.O. requests can be handled in parallel, reducing the queuing time for each request. So, so much with RAID level 0. Let's go with RAID level 1. 
So, RAID Level 1 differs from RAID Levels 2 through 6 in the way in which redundancy is achieved. In these other RAID schemes, some form of parity calculation is used to introduce redundancy, whereas in RAID Level 1, redundancy is achieved by the simple expedient of duplicating all the data. As with figure 6.6b shows, data striping is used as in RAID 0, but in this case, each logical strip is mapped to two separate physical disks so that every disk in the array has a mirror disk that contains the same data. RAID level 1 can also be implemented without data striping, though this is less common. So there are a number of positive aspects to the RAID, 1 organ or RAID level 1 organization. First is, a read request can be serviced by either of the two disks that contain the requested data, whichever one involves the minimum sick time plus rotational latency. Second, a write request requires that both corresponding strips be updated, but this can be done in parallel. Thus, the write performance is dictated by the slower of the two writes, such as the one that involves the larger sick time plus rotational latency. However, there is no write penalty with RAID Level 1. RAID levels 2 to 3 involve the use of parity bits. Therefore, when a single strip is updated, the array management software must compute and update the parity bits as well as updating the actual strip in question. Third, recovery from a failure is simple. When a drive fails, the data may still be accessed from the second drive. The principal disadvantage of RAID level 1 is the cost. It requires this twice the disk space of the logical disk that it supports. Because of that, a RAID level 1 configuration is likely to be limited to drives that store system software and data and other highly critical files. In these cases, RAID level 1 provides real-time copy of all data so that in the event of a disk failure, all of the crit critical data are still immediately available. In a transaction-oriented environment, RAID Level 1 can achieve the high I.O. request rates if the bulk of the requests are reads. In this situation, the performance of RAID Level 1 can approach double of that of RAID Level 0. However, if a substantial fraction of the I.O. requests are write requests, then there may be no significant performance gain over RAID Level 0. RAID Level 1 may also provide improved performance over RAID Level 0 for data transfer intensive applications with a high per percentage of reads. Improvement occurs if the application can split each read request so that both disk members participate. So, next to RAID Level 1 is RAID Level 2, of course. So, RAID Levels 2 and 3 make use of a parallel access technique. In a parallel access array, all member disks participate in the execution of every I.O. request. Typically, the spindles of the individual drives are synchronized so that each disk head is in the same position on each disk at any given time. As in the other RAID schemes, data striping is used. In the case of RAID Level 2 and 3, the strips are very small often as small as a single byte or word. With RAID Level 2, an error correcting code is calculated across corresponding bits on each data disk and the bits of the code are stored in the corresponding bit positions on multiple parts parity disk. Typically, a Hamming code is used, which is able to correct single-bit errors and detect double-bit errors. Although RAID Level 2 requires fewer disks than RAID Level 1, it is still rather costly. The number of redundant disks is proportional to the lag of the number of data disks. On a single read, all disks are simultaneously accessed. The requested data and the associated error correcting code are delivered to the array controller. If there is a single bit error, the controller can recognize and correct the error instantly so that the read access time is not slowed. On a single write, all data disks and parity disks must, must be accessed for the write operation. So RAID Level 2 would only be effective choice in an environment in which many disk errors occur. So that is the only advantage of level, uh, RAID Level 2. Given the high reliability of individual disks and disk drives, RAID 2 is overkill and is not implemented because it's expensive. So next to RAID Level 2 is RAID Level 3. 
So, RAID Level 3 is organized and in a similar fashion to RAID Level 2. The difference is that RAID Level 3 requires only a single redundant disk no matter how large the disk array. RAID Level 3 employs parallel access with data distributed in small strips and then, instead of an error-correcting code, a simple parity bit is computed for the set of individual bits in the same position on all of the data disks. In the event of a drive failure, the parity drive is accessed and data is reconstructed from the remaining devices. Once the failed drive is replaced, the missing data can be restored onto the new drive and operation resumed. In the event of a disk failure, all of the data are still available in what is referred to as reduced mode. In this mode, for reads, the missing data are regenerated on the fly using the exclusive OR calculation. When data are written to a reduced RAID Level 3 array, consistency of the parity must be maintained for later regeneration. Return to full operation requires that the failed disk be replaced and the entire contents of the failed disk be regenerated onto the new disk. Because the data are striped in very small strips, RAID Level 3 can achieve a very high data transfer rates. Any I.O. request will involve the parallel transfer of data from all of the data disks. For large transfers, the performance improvement is especially noticeable. On the other hand, only one I.O. request can be executed at a time. Thus, in a transaction-oriented environment, performance suffer if we're going to use RAID Level 3. So next to RAID Level 3 is RAID Level 4. So RAID Levels 4 through 6 make use of an independent access technique. In an independent access array, each member disk operates independently so that separate I.O. requests can be satisfied in parallel. Because of this, independent access arrays are more suitable for applications that require high I.O. request rates and are relatively less suited for applications that require high data transfer rates. As in the other RAID schemes, data striping is used. In the case of RAID levels 4 through 6, the strips are relatively large. With RAID level 4, a bit-by-bit -bit parity strip is calculated across corresponding strips on each data disk, and the parity bits are stored in the corresponding strip on the parity disk. And then also, RAID level 4 involves a write penalty when an I.O. write request of a small size is performed. Each time that a write occurs, the uh, array management software must update not only the user data but also the corresponding parity bits. To calculate the new parity, the array management software must read the old user strip and the old parity strip. Then it can update these two strips with the new data and the newly calculated parity. Thus, each strip write involves two reads and two writes. In the case of a larger I.O. write that involves strips on all disk drives, parity is easily computed by calculation using only the new data bits. Thus, the parity drive can be updated in parallel with the data drives and there are no extra reads or writes. In any case, every write operation must involve the parity disk, which therefore can become a bottleneck. Okay, next is we have RAID Levels 5 and RAID Level 6. So, RAID Level 5 is organized in a similar fashion to RAID Level 4. The difference is that RAID Level 5 distributes the parity strips across all disks. A typical allocation is a round-robin scheme as illustrated in the figure of uh, figure 6.8F. For an end disk array, the parity strip is on a different disk for the first N stripes, and the pattern then repeats. The distribution of parity strips across all drives avoids the potential I.O. bottleneck found in RAID Level 4. RAID 6 was introduced in a subsequent paper by the Berkeley researchers. So, in the RAID 6 scheme, two different parity calculations are carried out and stored in separate blocks on different disks. Thus, a RAID Level 6 array whose user data require N disk consists of N plus 2 disk. So, in figure 6.6G as illustrated previously, uh, this illustrates the scheme. P and Q are two different data check algorithms. One of the two is the exclusive OR calculation used in RAD RAID Level 4 and 5, but the other is an independent data check algorithm. This makes it possible to regenerate data even if two disks containing user data fail. So the advantage of RAID Level 6 is that 
It provides extremely high data availability. Three disks would have to fail within the MTTR or mean time to repair interval to cause the data to be lost. On the other hand, RAID Level 6 incurs a substantial write penalty because each write affects two parity blocks. Performance benchmarks show a RAID Level 6 controller can suffer more than a 30% drop in overall write performance compared with the RAID Level 5 implementation. RAID 5 and RAID Level 6 read performance is comparable. So next is a figure, uh, rather table 6.4 uh, about the comparison of, of different levels of RAID from 0 to, uh, to 6. So as we can see for level 0, the advantages, I.O. performance is greatly improved by spreading the I.O. load across many channels and drives. Also, no parity calculation overhead is involved. Very simple in design and easy to implement. And then, disadvantage, the failure of just one drive will result in all data in an array being lost. So, the application of RAID Level 0 is for video production and editing, image editing, pre-press applications, and any application requiring high bandwidth. So, RAID Level 1, so 100% redundancy of data means no rebuild is necessary in case of a disk failure, just a copy to the replacement disk. Then, under certain circumstances, RAID 1 can sustain multiple simultaneous drive failures and also the simplest RAID storage subsystem design. The disadvantage is that highest disk overhead of all RAID types, which is 100% inefficient. So, it is used in payroll systems, accounting, financial, and any application requiring very high availability. So, for RAID Level 2, the advantages, extreme high data and transfer rates and uh, possible. The higher the data transfer rate required, the better the ratio of data disk to ECC disk or the error correcting code disk. And then relatively simple controller design compared to RAID levels 3, 4, and 5. So the disadvantages, very high ratio of ECC disk to data disk with a smaller word sizes. So it is inefficient. And then entry level cost very high, requires very high transfer rate requirement to justify. So applications, no commercial implementation exists or not commercially viable because as it is said, it's not included in the, the rate levels that is actually used in the industry. So to continue for... Uh, the next table is we have RAID level 3. So very high read data transfer rate, very high write data transfer rate. Disk failure has a insignificant impact on throughput and low ratio of ECC or parity disk to data disk means high efficiency. The disadvantage is that transaction rate equal to that of a single disk drive at best if spindles are synchronized. And another disadvantage, Controller design is fairly complex. So, these are used in video production and live streaming, image editing, video editing, pre-press application, and any application requiring high throughput. Then, for RAID Level 4, the advantages are very high read data transaction rate and low ratio of ECC or parity disk to data disk mean high efficiency. So, the advantages are quite complex controller design, Worst write transaction on rate, and then and write aggregate transfer rate. Then difficult and efficient data rebuild in the event of disk failure. So just the same with RAID level two, there's no commercial implementations exist or it's not commercially viable. And then for RAID level five, the advantages are highest read data transaction rate, low ratio of ECC. Uh, to data disk means high efficiency and good aggregate transfer rate. So the disadvantage is most complex controller design, difficult to rebuild in the event of a disk failure as compared to RAID level 1. So the applications are the following. It can be used as file and application servers, database servers, web email and news servers, intranet servers, and most versatile RAID levels. And then last but not the least is RAID level 6. 
provides for an extremely high data fault tolerance and can sustain multiple simultaneous drive failures. So the disadvantage is more complex controller design. Controller overhead to compute parity addresses is extremely high. And then this is the perfect solution for mission critical applications. Uh, meaning for mission critical applications, if your applications uh, is very significant or very important, once that it is uh, not functioning, it will affect the whole operations of your company. So that is why it is called mission critical applications. So, so much for RAID. Next is we have the solid state uh, disk compared to an HDD or hard disk drive. So SSDs have the following advantages over HDDs. First is high performance input or output operations per second or IOPS significantly increases performance of the IO subsystems. Next is durability, less susceptible to physical shock and vibration because SSD is composed of chips compared to hard disk drive which is platters. Um, it is not, uh, it's, it's not susceptible, uh, less susceptible the physical shock and vibration because there are no moving mechanism inside the disk. Next is longer lifespan. SSDs are not susceptible to mechanical wear because um, SSD does not have a read-write head. And then next is lower power consumption. SSDs use considerably less than comparable size HDDs. They are smaller so they can uh, consume lower power. And then quieter and cooler running capabilities, less floor space required, lower energy cost, and a greener enterprise. And then lower access times and latency rates over 10 times faster than the spinning disk in, an, in a hard disk drive. And then currently, HDDs enjoy a cost per bit advantage. Actually, if you're going to compare the prices of SSD and HDD with the same capacity, HDD is lower in price. And of course, lower in price and capacity advantage, but these differences are already shrinking because nowadays, SSD is also already used in newer laptops. Okay, next is we have the table 6.5. Uh, uh, we have another comparison of solid state drives and disk drives in, in table. As the cost of flash based SSDs have dropped and the performance and bit density increased, SSDs have become increasingly competitive with HDDs. So, this table shows the typical measures of comparison at the time of this uh, presentation is made. So, as we can see, uh, for the file copy or write speed, so, flash, uh, non-flash drive or SSD is faster compared to a hard disk drive. And then, power draw or battery life. So, uh, flash drives has the more advantage over the hard disk drives. And then, uh, for storage capacity, actually, um, HDD has higher capacity than the uh, flash drives or SSDs. And then, of course, cost. Uh, as of now, SSD are more expensive than HDDs. Okay, next is we have figure 6.8, solid state drive architecture. So, this illustrates a general view of the common architectural system component associated with any SSD system. On the host system to operating system invokes file system software to access data on the disk. The file system, in turn, invokes I.O. driver software. The I.O. driver software provides host access to the particular SSD product. The interface component in this figure refers to the physical and electrical interface between the host processor and the SSD peripheral device. If the device is an internal hard drive, a common interface is PCIe or the PCI Express. For external devi devices of the SSD, one common interface is the USB. Uh, USB port. In addition to the interface to the host system, the SSD contains the following components. First is we have the controller. Provides SSD device level interfacing and firmware execution. Next is we have the addressing. Uh, logic that performs the selection function across the flash memory components. And then we have the data buffer or cache. High speed RAM memory components used for speed matching and to increase increased data throughput and then we also have error detection 
or rather correction, logic for error detection and correction. Yeah, it can be detected and corrected. And then we have flash memory components, individual NAT end or non-flash chips. So practical uses of SSD and then choosing over SSD by, um, or, um, or rather, why is it hard disk drives are still used even though um, it is lower compared to S SSD? So these are the practical issues. There are two practical issues peculiar to SSDs that are not faced by HDDs. First, SSD performance has a tendency to slow down as the device is used. To understand the reason for this, you need to know that files are stored on a disk as a set of pages, typically 4 kilobyte in length. These pages are not necessarily and in not typically stored as a contiguous set of pages on the disk. The reason for this arrangement is explained uh, about vir and the virtual memory in Chapter 8. However, flash memory is accessed in blocks, not in pages, with a typically block of size of 512 kilobytes, so that there are typically 128 pages per block. Now consider what must be done to write a page onto a flash memory. First is the entire block must be read from the flash memory and placed in a RAM buffer. Then the appropriate page in the RAM buffer is updated. Second, before the block can be written back to flash memory, the entire block of flash memory must be erased. It is not possible to erase just one page of the flash memory. Third, the entire block from the buffer is now written back to the flash memory. Now, when a flash drive is relatively empty and a new file is created, the pages of that file are written onto the drive contiguously so that one or only a few blocks are affected. However, over time, because of the way virtual memory works, files become fragmented with pages scattered over multiple blocks. As the drive becomes more occupied, there is more fragmentation, so the writing of a new file can affect multiple blocks. Thus, the writing of multiple pages from one block becomes slower the more fully occupied the disk is. Manufacturers have developed a variety of techniques to compensate for this property of flash memory, such as setting aside a substantial portion of the SSD as extra space for write operation, which is called over-provisioning, then to erase the inactive pages during idle time used to defragment the disk. Another technique is the trim command, which allows an operating system to inform a solid state drive or the SSD which blocks of data are no longer considered in use and can be wiped internally. A second practical issue with the flash memory drives is that a flash memory becomes unusable after a certain number of writes. As flash cells are stressed, they lose their ability to record and retain values. A typical limit is 100,000 writes. Techniques for prolonging the life of an SSD drive include front-ending the flash with a cache to delay and group write operations using wear leveling algorithms that evenly distribute writes across block of cells and sophisticated bad block management techniques. In addition, vendors are deploying SSDs in RAID configurations to further reduce the problem probability of data loss. Most flash devices are also capable of est estimating their own remaining lifetime so systems can anticipate failure and take preemptive actions. So that's why in computer systems, there are already laptops that employs a, a hard disk drive with an SSD. So the best setup is the operating systems uh, should be installed in the SSD so that it can uh, react faster while our data should be put in the hard disk drives because if we're always putting our data inside the SSD as as you've already as we have already as I've already discussed um, um every time you use SSD just like it actually it is like a projector um, the the lifetime of a for example for a projector of the of uh, the light of the projector will also be lessened also with SSD so that's why again in a typical computer setup SS, uh, the SSD is where the operating system is installed in its other applications while the data is in a separate hard disk drive for backup Okay, next is we have the table 6.6. .6. Okay, we're already finished with um, SSD. Next is we have optical disk products. So, in 1983, one of the most successful consumer products of all time was introduced. The compact disk or CD, uh, this digital audio system. 
The CD is a non-erasable disc that can store more than 60 minutes of audio information on one side. The huge commercial success of the CD enabled the development of low-cost optical disk storage technology that has revolutionized computer data storage. A variety of optical disk systems have been introduced in this table. So we have CD or the compact disk, the CD-ROM, the compact disk read-only memory, the CD-R or the CD-recordable, CD-RW, CD-rewritable, DVD, Digital Versatile Disc, DVD-R, DVD Recordable, DVD-RW, DVD Rewritable, and Blu-ray DVD. So, uh, again, this will be discussed uh, on the next slides. So, first is we have CD-ROM or the Compact Disc Read-Only Memory. Both the audio CD and the CD-ROM or the Compact Disc Read-Only Memory share a similar technology. Okay, so audio CD specifically, this is for audio purposes only. If you are buying, for example, if you're a K-pop fan and you're buying physical albums, so mostly these physical albums are in a form of an audio CD. So they're similar. So the difference is that the main difference is that the CD-ROM players are more rugged and have error correction devices to ensure that data are properly transferred from disk to computer. Both types of disk are made the same way. The disk is formed from a resin such as polycarbonate. Digitally recorded information, either music or computer data. So that, that's also the difference. Audio CD is uh, uh, recorded music is there while um, CD-ROM, this is where computer data is stored. So, this is imprinted as a series of microscopic pits on the surface of the polycarbonate. This is done, first of all, with a finely focused high-intensity laser to create a master disk. The master is used in turn to make a die to stamp out copies onto polycarbonate. The pitted surface is then coated with a highly reflective surface, usually aluminum or gold. This shiny surface is protected against dust and scratches by a top coat of clear acrylic. Finally, a label can be silk screened onto the acrylic. So, next is the figure 6.9 CD operation. So, information is retrieved from a CD or CD-ROM by a low-powered laser house in an optical disc player or drive unit. The laser shines through the clear polycarbonate while a motor spins the disc past it, as in this figure. The intensity of the reflected light of the laser changes at it, as it encounters a pit. So, this is the pit. Specifically, if the laser beam falls on a pit which has a somewhat rough surface, the light scatters and a low intensity is reflected back to the source. The areas between pits are called land. So this is the land. A land is a smooth surface which reflects back at higher intensity. The change between pits and lands is detected by a photo sensor and converted into a digital signal. The sensor tests the surface at regular intervals. Beginning or end of a pit represents a 1. When no change in elevation occurs between intervals, a zero is recorded. Recall that on a magnetic disk, information is recorded in concentric tracks. With the simplest constant angular velocity or CAV system, the number of bits per track is constant. An increase in density is achieved with multiple zoned recording in which the surface is divided into a number of zones with zones farther from the center containing more bits than zones closer to the center. Although this technique increases capacity, it is still not optimal. To achieve greater capacity for CDs and CD-ROMs, they do not organize information on concentric tracks. Instead, the disk contains a single spiral track beginning near the center and spiraling out to the outer edge of the disk. Sectors near the outside of the disk are the same length as those near the inside. Thus, information is packed evenly across the disk in segments of the same size and this are scanned at the same rate by rotating the disk at a variable speed. The pits are then read by the laser at a constant linear velocity or CLV. The disk rotates more slowly for accesses near the outer edge than those for the near the center. Thus, the capacity of a track and the rotational delay both increase for positions nearer the outer edge of the disk. The capacity for a CD-ROM is about 680 MB. 
Then next is another illustration, figure 6.10, the CD-ROM block format. So data on the CD-ROM are organized as a sequence of blocks. A typical block format is shown in this figure. It consists of the following fields. First is sync. The sync field identifies the beginning of a block. It contains of a byte of all zeros, 10 bytes of all ones, and a byte of all zeros. Next is we have the header. The header contains the block address and the mode byte. Mode 0 specifies a blank data field. Mode 1 specifies the use of an error correcting code and 2048 bytes of data. Mode 2 specifies 2336 bytes of user data with no error correcting code. Then next is we have data which is for user data and then we have auxiliary additional user data in mode 2. So in mode 1 this is a 288 byte error correcting code. So with the use of CLV, random access becomes more difficult. Locating a specific address involves moving the head to the general area, adjusting the rotation speed and reading the address, and then making minor adjustments to find and access the specific sector. So another information for CD-ROM is that CD-ROM is appropriate for the distribution of large amounts of data to a large number of users. Because of the expense of the initial writing process, it is not appropriate for individualized applications. Compared with traditional magnetic disk, the CD-ROM has two advantages. First, the optical disk together with the information stored on it can be mass replicated inexpensively. Unlike a magnetic disk, the database on a magnetic disk has to be produced by copying one disk at a time using two disk drives. So that's why for CD-ROM, piracy is very, um, uh, pro, uh, it's, uh, it has many uh, pirate, piracy issues of, in CD-ROM because it can be replicated inexpensively. You're just going to buy a blank CD to copy the, for example, an original CD. And then the optical disk is removable, allowing the disk itself to be used for archival storage. So that's why uh, CD-ROMs are used for backups. Most magnetic disks are non-removable. The information on non-removable disk, magnetic disk must be first copied to another storage medium before the disk drive can be used to store new information. So the following are the disadvantages of CD-ROM are as follows. It is read-only and cannot be updated. It has an access time much longer than that of a magnetic disk drive as much as half a second. So it is slower. Okay. Then next is we have, aside from CD-ROM, is we have two types. Another two types of uh, CDs or optical disk disks are the CD recordable or the CDR and the CD writable CDRW. So to accommodate applications in which only a small one or a small number of copies of a set of data is needed, the write once and read many CD known as the CD recordable or the CDR has been developed. For CDR, a disk is prepared in such a way that it can be subsequently written once with a laser beam of modest intensity. Thus, with a somewhat more expensive disk controllers done for the CD-ROM, the customer can write once as well as read the disk. So the CDR medium is similar to but not identical to that of a CD or a CD-ROM. For CDs and CD-ROMs, information is recorded by pitting the surface of the medium, which changes reflectivity. For a CDR, the medium includes a dye layer. The dye is used to change reflectivity and is activated by a high-intensity laser. The resulting disk can be read on a CDR drive or a CD-ROM drive. The CDR optical disk is attractive for archival storage of documents and files. It provides a permanent record of large volumes of user data. So aside from CDR, is we have the CDRW. Optical disk can be repeatedly written and overwritten, so that's why it's called rewritable, as with a magnetic disk. Although a number of approaches have been tried, the only pure optical approach that has proved attractive is called the phase change. The phase change disk uses a material that has two significantly different reflectivities in two different phase states. There is an amorphous state in which the molecules exhibit a random orientation, 
that reflects light poorly and a crystalline state which has a smooth surface that reflects light well. A beam of la laser light can change the material from one phase to the other. The primary disadvantage of phase change optical disc is that the material eventually and permanently loses its desirable properties. Current materials can be used for between 500 and 1 million array cycles. Uh, actually, that's already... Um, maximizing it's already many cycles so the cdrw has the obvious advantage over cd-rom and cdr that it can be rewritten and thus used as a true secondary storage as such it competes with the magnetic disk a key advantage of the optical disk is that the engineering tolerances for optical disks are much less severe than for high capacity magnetic disks thus they exhibit higher reliability and longer life and also if you already seen the actual CD CDR, CDRW, and for example, CD-ROM, for example, for a CD-ROM, their uh, recording um, side, it has different, they, they, you can distinguish the color of each uh, CD. Okay, next is we have figure 6.11, which is all about comparison of a CD-ROM and DVD-ROM. With the capacious digital versatile disk or higher capacity than the CD-ROM or the CD, the electronics industry has at last found an acceptable replacement for the analog VHS videotape. So that's why DVD sometimes is called the digital video disk because uh, mostly the uh, high-definition high movies are already stored in DVD and not in CD because uh, for CD, it has lower... Um, lower uh, definition it's not 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 just a theater high definition as we can see in movies so the dvd has replaced the videotape used in video cassette recorders or vcrs and more important for this discussion replace the cd-rom in personal computers and servers because it, of course it has a higher capacity so the dvd takes video into the digital age and of course, DVD is also subject for piracy at that time. It delivers movies with impressive picture quality and it can be randomly accessed like audio CDs, which DVD machines can also play. So the good thing with DVD players it does is, is that it is backwards compatible. It can play um, CDs with recorded video or with audio CD or with CDR or uh, CDR or CDRW that has movies in it. It can also be played. And then vast volumes of data can be crammed onto the disk, currently seven times as much of a CD-ROM. Uh, the typical capacity is 4 gig. So with DVD's huge storage capacity and vivid quality, PC games have become more realistic and educational software incorporates more video. So that's why when DVD was out and released, um, the, the, the games, the PC games are more robust in, in video rendering and compared when the game was just in a CD-ROM. And then following in the wake of this development has been a new crest of traffic over the internet and corporate intranets as this material is incorporated into websites. The DVD's greater capacity is due to three differences from CDs. So as we can compare, so number one, bits are packed more closely on a DVD. The spacing between loops of a spiral on a CD is 1.6 a micrometer and the minimum distance between pits along the spiral is 0 0.834 micrometer the dvd uses a laser with shorter wavelength and achieves a loop spacing of 0 0.74 micrometer and a minimum distance between 0 0.4 um, micrometer, almost half. So the result of these two improvements is about a seven-fold increase in capacity to about, as I've said, that DVD typ typical um, capacity is about four, 4 gig and of course exact is 4.7 gig. So next, the DVD employs a second layer of bits and lands on top of the first layer. A dual layer DVD has a semi-reflective layer on top of the reflective layer and by adjusting focus, the lasers in DVD drives can read each layer separately. So this technique almost doubles the capacity of the disk to about 8.5 gigabytes. 
the lower reflectivity of the second layer limits its storage capacity so that a full uh, doubling is not achieved. So next, the DVD-ROM can be two-sided, whereas data are recorded on only one side of a CD. This brings a total capacity of up to 17 gigabytes of space for a DVD, if still um, two-sided. Okay, uh, first in the second, we have dual layer, while in number three for uh, DVD-ROM that is two-sided, dual layer and then double-sided, so that's why it will become 17 gigabytes. Okay, next is we have figure 6.12, the optical memory characteristics. So high-definition optical disks are designed to store high-definition videos and to provide significantly greater storage capacity compared to DVDs. The higher bit density is achieved by using a laser with a shorter wavelength in the blue-violet range. The data pits, which constitute digital ones and zeros, are smaller on the high-definition optical disc compared to DVD because of the shorter laser wavelength. If DVD is already um, using shorter wavelength, um, Blu-ray uses more, uh, a, 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 a shorter wavelength than DVD. So two competing disc formats and technologies initially competed for market acceptance. We have the HD DVD and the Blu-ray DVD. So the Blu-ray scheme ultimately achieved market dominance. So because of, again, it's a higher capacity. So HD DVD scheme can store 15 uh, gigabytes on a single layer on a single side. Blu-ray positions the data layer on the disc closer to the laser as shown on the right-hand side of each diagram in figure 6.12, as, as, as this figure. So this enables a tighter focus and less distortion, and thus smaller pits and tracks. So because of this, Blu-ray can store 25 gigabytes on a single layer, compared with HD DVD single layer, which is 15 gigabytes. The three versions are available, the read-only, the BD-ROM, record, recordable ones, BDR and the re-recordable BDRE, or not re-rewritable RW, but for Blu-ray, it's BDRE, re-recordable. Okay, so we're finished with optical disks. Next is we have, last but not the least, is we have magnetic tapes. So tape systems use the same reading and recording techniques as disk systems. The medium is flexible polyester similar to that used in some clothing, uh, taped coated with magnetizable material. The coating may consist of particles of pure metal and special binders of or vapor plated metal films. The tape and the tape drive are analogous to a home tape recorder system. Tape widths may vary from 0.38 centimeters or 0.15 inch to 1.27 centimeter or 0.5 inch. Tapes used to be packaged as open reels that have to be threaded through a second spindle for use. Today, virtually all tapes are housed in cartridges. So data on the tape are structured as a number of parallel tracks running lengthwise. Earlier tape systems typically used nine tracks. This made it possible to store data one byte at a time with an additional parity bit as the ninth track. This was followed by tape systems using 18 or 36 tracks corresponding to a digital word or double word. The recording of data in this form is referred to as parallel recording. Most modern systems instead use serial recording, in which data are laid out as a sequence of bits along each track as is done with magnetic disks. As with the disk, the data are read and written in contiguous blocks called physical records on a tape. Blocks on the tape are separated by gaps referred to as inter-record gaps. As with the disk, the tape is formatted to assist in local, locating physical records. So in this figure 6.13 is shown the typical magnetic tape features. So the typical recording technique used in serial tapes is referred to as the serpentine recording. So serpentines like a snake. In this technique, when data are being recorded, the first set of bits is recorded along the whole length of the tape. When the end of the tape is reached, the heads are repositioned to record a new track. And the tape is again recorded in its whole length, this time in the opposite direction. That process continues back and forth until the tape is full. So uh, as, as uh, seen in uh, letter A, serpentine reading and 
writing. To increase the speed, the read-write head is capable of reading and writing a number of adjacent tracks and simultaneously, typically, two to eight tracks. Data are still recorded serially along individual tracks, but blocks in sequence are stored on adjacent tracks as suggested with uh, figure 16.6.13b. Uh, 6, so, a tape drive is a sequential access device. If the tape head is positioned at record 1, then to read record N, it is necessarily to read physical records from 1 through N minus 1, 1 at a time. So, if you're positioned at record 1 and you want to access record uh, 10, you need to go through 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, that's why it's N minus 1. If the head is currently positioned beyond the desired record, it is necessary to rewind the tape a certain distance and begin reading forward. Unlike the disk, the tape is in motion only during a read or write operation. In contrast to the tape, the disk drive is referred to as a direct access device. So this uh, magnetic tape is a sequential access so, it's really very slow and it's only used for backups. While magnetic disk drives are direct access device, a disk drive need not read all the sectors on a disk sequentially to get to the desired one. It must only wait for the intervening sectors within one track and can make successive accesses to any track. Then, magnetic tape was the first kind of secondary memory before uh, magnetic disk drives are, are released or invented. It is still widely used as the lower cost, slowest speed member of the memory hierarchy. So, that's why it is the bottom. It has also has the highest capacity, but of course, it is uh, the slowest. So, it is just used for backups. So, next is we have table 6.7. So, we have LTO tape drive. So, the dominant tape technology today is the cartridge system known as linear tape open or the LTO tape drive. LTO was developed in the late 1990s as an open source alternative to the various proprietary systems on the market. So, this table shows parameters of for the various LTO generations. So, we started with LTO1 up to LTO8. So, we're already finished with the types of external memory. So, for the summary, so for Chapter 6, we've discussed magnetic disk, uh, its mechanism for magnetic read and write, data organization and formatting, its physical characteristics, and disk performance parameters. Next is we have also solid state drive. So, uh, we have compared the difference between SSD to HDD and SSD organization as different with HDD and what are the practical issues as to why HDD is still used even though SSD has more of the advantage. And then we also have magnetic tapes as already discussed and RAID. Uh, from RAID level 0 to 6, and then opt optical memory such as compact disks or CD, the digital versatile disks, or the DVD or the high definition optical disks such as HD DVD and Blu ray DVD. So, I hope that you've learned something from this chapter external memory. So, please don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. And I hope that everything is doing well for you. So, see you on the next chapter. So, good day. God bless and stay safe.